in the eyes of the Father. We thank you and we remember. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take the cup together. Thank you, worship team. Whew. All right. Morning, church. I know I've already said good morning. I'm excited. I, I'm, I'm with you, Alex. The, the, I, I don't think that the weather affects my mood that much, but I feel it today. Um, I also, no, I'll get to that a little bit later. Today we're going to be teaching uh, through 2 Samuel chapters 6 and 7. If you want to go there, you can. We'll have the scripture on the, on the screen. And just so you know, when we put the, the text on the screen, it's always coming from the English Standard Version. That's just the <laughs> that's just that's just the version that's most readily available on my on my computer when I'm copying and pasting it in there, um, and so you might find if you're reading in a different version the the, ly the lyrics <laughs> the words are a little bit different but the message is the same. Um, I want to give you a little bit of context before we get into the first section of text, um, moving in the end of chapter five and and into six. Oh right, and uh, youth and Route fifty seven you are dismissed. Grade five to twelve. Go and be blessed. Did I hear bye, Hayden? Bye, Hayden. Is that what you said? <laughs> See ya. Um, just moving into this chapter, what's happened is there's been a little bit more conflict. And I, I really wrestled with this idea this week, especially in light of the conflict we see in the world today. Uh, it's their foes, the Philistines, who they've they've just had some, some positive... Um, inroads with, and I've, I've kind of spent some time thinking about uh, the Old Testament context for war, and it became apparent that genocide was the cultural norm in this time. Literally everybody, it was this primal um, survival instinct that if you weren't for us, that you wanted to kill us. And so it's best for us to kill you before you kill us. And it's, it's just the way of the world at this time. In fact, we see prior to Samuel, we see um, in Joshua that, that God actually commanded Israel, his nation, to enter the promised land. And they were to defeat everybody. They were meant to wipe them out. And this is a, a, a theological nuke for many of us. This just seems so out of line with the character of God. But when we put it against the backdrop of this, again, this culture uh, of genocide being the norm, where everybody is trying to finish everybody, it makes a little more sense. Still, It's still a tough one to wrestle with. We also need to understand this idea that... Um, that these nations weren't as much of a mosaic as they are today. If, if we were to say, ah, you know what? Uh, we don't believe in what they believe in Smulgaria, so we should just wipe them out and, and kill them all. It, it makes no sense. It, it's off because we know here in Canada there's a, a breadth of, of beliefs. There's a breadth of believers and, and people who are, are doing their own thing. But there was, it was a little bit more homogeneous, I think is the word. It was a little bit more in the, in the way that if, if you were uh, a Philistine, you worshipped Philistine gods. You practiced Philistine, Philistine sacrifices. And you were in, in fully immersed in Philistine beliefs. And if you were an Israelite, you followed Yahweh. You followed the one true God. And so with that as the background... We, we see David and his armies. He now is king of Israel. And they are returning with the Ark of the Covenant. In fact, we're going to read, and before we read, I want to give you a little bit of a title. And, and, and I want to give a little bit of context here too. I don't recommend reading the Bible the way I'm about to read it with you. I recommend reading the Bible, opening it, and, and inviting the Holy Spirit to help you read through and, and have Him speak to you. I'm going to put a filter on your eyes through which we're going to read these sections of scriptures. And so that's going to be good for today. This isn't the way you should normally read the Bible. I would strongly recommend that you, you spend some time praying, God, speak to me. Speak to me through your word. Then open your Bible. 
at wherever you're reading your Bible at that time and just receive what he has for you. Don't let other people tell you what you should be thinking about, about reading the Bible. You can use commentaries and stuff after to kind of compare what you've heard from God and, and develop, and it's good. You, there, there are good and wise people that can speak into your life through text. But today I'm going to put these filters on your eyes. And the first filter is this. We're going to look at Uzzah's sacrifice and David's reverence. I workshopped a joke about Uzzah and my last name being Buzza, and just kind of, um, I workshopped it in the car. That's where I do my best work. I'm driving and I'm thinking to myself, I wonder how funny it would be to make some comment about, yeah, everybody in the church is related. Here's Uzzah, another one of those Buzzas. And, you know, okay, but it didn't work in the car, and that's why I'm not going to share that one with you here today. I want you to, <laughs> good, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. So, Uzzah's sacrifice and David's reverence. I want those to be the filters as we read through. And we're going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 6. Let's read verses 5 to 8 together. And David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it. For the oxen stumbled. Let me pause just for a second. So Uzzah would have been near the ark of the covenant where the presence of God was. And there were explicit rules about not touching the Ark of the Covenant. It was holy. It was not to be touched by anyone. They had rigged a special cart to transport it where it needed to go. But he saw that one of the ox stumbled. And he was worried that this precious Ark would fall. And so he reached out to, to offer stability to the Ark of the Covenant. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him down there because of his error. And he died there because, beside the Ark of God. And David was angry because the Lord had broken out against Uzzah. And that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. Let's look at a couple things that happened here. I already made one comment about Old Testament war, and that's one of those things that I still, uh, I, I know that there will be a day when I'm with the Father and He will reveal His, his plan and his, his sovereign ideas for, for what happened there. It's something I struggle with. And even here we see David. He's, he's frustrated with God. Like, he, he can see it probably all unfold. It's, it's probably obvious to David that that Uzzah's only thought was to, to save this special thing from falling to the ground. And with the, with the right motivation, he reaches out to stabilize it. And honestly, there are echoes of what Uzzah did and what Saul was rebuked for in 1 Samuel. Uh, many, of, many of you were here as we were teaching through 1 Samuel, and you'll remember that Saul was about to go to war. And he was told, wait seven days, and then, uh, uh, um, my goodness, Samuel, <laughs> mind blank there. Samuel would come and offer the sacrifice ahead of the war so that they would be blessed, they would have uh, success in the war. Well, Saul waited, and the time had gone, and he did not want to go to war without the sacrifice, but there was no Samuel. So, in his mind, that sacrifice was what was important. And so he sacrificed before God. Samuel arrives, and Samuel says, oh, you got it all wrong. You were called to obedience. Your job was to go and wait. You've messed it all up. Though your motivation was to, to do the right thing, you weren't obedient. In the same way, we see God's uh, priority of obedience, even though Uzzah had probably the right heart, the right intentions, trying to stabilize the Ark of the Covenant, he wasn't obedient. Obedience meant that he wouldn't touch it, that he would rather see it fall to the ground or let God do what he needs to do with it than, than disobey and touch it. And because he disobeyed, he was killed. And this is something I've been chewing on all week. I thought to myself, okay, what do I believe about life? 
life on earth isn't the end all be all. And I thought to myself, okay, well, maybe God zapped as a, but then brought him right into his presence right at that moment. Maybe as a felt no pain, and maybe as a is with the Father today. And that may be true. I kind of, I want to believe that. We don't know as I hear. But then we see this part that, that God, his, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah. He was really upset that Uzzah had touched the ark. There's an emotion attached. And, and we give weight to these words because we believe that these are inspired words of God. This is what's for us. We are being told what we're meant to be told. So it's not an author kind of filling in the blanks, oh, God must have been mad and killed him. No, this is God's word for us. It says the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah. He was, ups- he was mad that Uzzah stabilized the ark, that he touched the ark. He was mad that he disobeyed. And so, again, this is a, a, a tough one for me to wrestle through. Uh, but it is what it is. And we see that David's response is the same kind of as ours probably. He was frustrated why would you do this to Uzzah? He was just trying to do the right thing. And they renamed the area Perez Uzzah to this day. Let's read on verses 9 to 11. And, and this is my reaction as well. David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David was not willing to take the ark of the Lord into the city of David. But David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. The presence of God was in the household of this, of this neighboring community. Because David was like, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't get this. I don't understand this power that's in this object, the ark. Let's not bring it into my city yet. I'm not ready for this. So contrasted against Uzzah's moment of disobedience but sacrifice, we see David's deep reverence. And reverence, a synonym, can be fear. Not fear like you're, not fear like you're fearful for your life, but in, the, in a sense, there is this, this, uh, this holy fear of God. That, that God is so holy. He is so powerful. He is so, his ways are so far beyond my ways that I'm, there's this nervousness. There's almost this anxiety that goes with this. And you know what, church? We could use a little bit more of this. Um, I know for me, I love coming in my untucked shirt. But I thought about this because I, I love that we're a, a T-shirts and jeans church. I, I believe, in fact, I was just having a conversation with Kevin last night, and we talked about what God did, what Jesus did on the throne, where there was a time for religion, where we had to kind of go through this formulaic uh, method of being right before God, when we had to do the animal sacrifice. But then when Jesus became the ultimate sacrifice, the, the um, man, I'm struggling for words saying, the curtain between them and the Holy of Holies, was literally torn apart. We were invited into his presence. There was this new intimacy. There wasn't this um, stodgy religion that we had to follow. There was now this relationship we were invited into. And I believe the way, the way we come into this room kind of reflects that. We're his children. I don't expect my kids to dress up for dinner with me. <laughs> I'm dad. In fact, uh, COVID has made PJs really acceptable at the dinner table. I don't know about you guys, but uh, isn't our family? But you know what? In that relationship, sometimes we lose the reverence that David shows here. That understanding that this is God. He's God of everything. He's not our buddy. He's not our chum. And even though we're invited to call him Abba, Daddy, Father, he is still the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so David gets it. He's got it right here. This reverence and this fear that he has of of the Father. It's appropriate. It can be confusing, but it's appropriate. All right, let's go on to our next point. The next one I want to give you is a filter of David's joy 
contrasted with Michael, and Michael sounds like a man's name, but it is his wife, Michael's disgust. And we're going to see right now in verses 12 to 15 what happens here. It was told King David, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. God's presence is in his, in his compound, in his family, and they have been blessed because of it. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, he sacrificed an ox and, fat da- and a fattened animal. And, and we, we know this scene here. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the, of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn. Let's pause there for a second. Um, yeah, it, it was it the 90s? You guys got to help me out, you worship leaders. Um, the, the, that song, um, I Will Become Even More Undignified. This Is that the 90s? Does that sound about right? Okay. There's a song that we would sing as a worship song, and it was declaring, I'm going I'm to become even, I'm going to become like David. I'm going to dance before the Lord. I'm not going to give a rip what anybody else thinks about me. I'm going to become even more. You think this is bad? You think this is undignified? I can become even more undignified than this. And it was this attempt, this idea of mirroring David's just abandon to the way he worshipped God. Remember, it started with reverence. It started with fear. Where he was petrified. He didn't even want the presence of God in his city for fear of what could come of that. But now he's seen the blessing. And so, okay, I'm bringing it in. I'm bringing the presence of God into the house of David. And I am rejoicing. And he, he goes down to his linen ephod, his underwear basically. And he starts dancing like we can picture just like this lunatic. It's totally out of context for everything else that's going on. Nobody else is dancing like David is dancing. And I find this funny. This is another thought I had this week. In fact, last night um, at SNL, we were led in worship by uh, a, a Latin team, uh, uh, not a Mexican, a Spanish-speaking team, and they did it bilingually. But the the vibe was very, like, it was loud, and uh, Cindy Dangerfield just but lost her mind dancing. She was having the time of her life. She was the dancing queen last night. She, and she declared it coming into the room. It's like, I am so ready for this. And I don't know how many cups of coffee she had had. Josiah, your mom was on fire last night. But it, it became the norm. There was this invitation into that kind of vibe, worshiping. And I know that for me, I've chased that on occasion. We've gone to worship nights where you just know everybody's on the same mission. We're all rejoicing like David rejoices. And we chase that vibe. But you know what we kind of do? We chase the comfort of knowing that we're not going to stand out from the rest of the congregation if we worship that way. We want the comfort of rejoicing with reckless abandon as long as everybody else is doing it. Right? And what's so special about this is is David was all eyes on God. He was overwhelmed with joy for what was happening. The presence of God was coming into his household. And he was losing his mind for all the right reasons. He didn't care who was watching. He didn't care if this was a fast song or a slow dance song. He was giving her before the Father. And, and, well, we see that not everybody appreciated it. If we read verse 6, 16, it says this. As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, who's the daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. And she despised him. In her heart. Despise is, is, is a stronger word than I would have probably guessed. She's probably embarrassed. Like he's supposed to be the king of, of God's people. That's not how a king behaves. She she was she despised him 
She was so angry with him. And we read on verse 20. Let's skip to verse 20. It goes like this. And David returned to bless his household. But Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How the king of Israel honored himself today, uncovered himself, no, honored himself today, uncovering himself today before the eyes of his servant, servants, female servants, as one of the vulgar fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. And David said to Michael, It was before the Lord who chose me above your father, a little dig there, and above all his house to appoint me as prince over Israel, the people of the Lord. And I will celebrate before the Lord. I will make myself yet more contemptible than this. And I will be abased in your eyes. But by the female servants of whom you have spoken, by them I shall be held in honor. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child to the day of her death. That, that, that seems like, well, that escalated quickly, right? That, that last little bit there seems a little bit much compared to everything else that's going on here. But we can connect the two. There, there's a, there's a, a reason that, that they are mashed one up against the other. It's God's strong way of saying, you've got it wrong, Michael. This is, this is what I want for my children. I want this joy. I want this rejoicing. I want this adoration. I want this understanding that what is happening is something to celebrate. So Michael's disgust was out of place. All right, third and final filter I want to give you. We see David's good intentions and God's plan. If we read in chapter 7 now, verses 1 to 3, it goes like this. Now when the, the king lived in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. And this is an, like a really important pause point, but let's pause here for a second. Um, again, the context of this is, remember when Israel was, was exiting Egypt, they literally ported with them the Ark of the Covenant, very carefully as we described here, and they would set up according to God's really specific instructions. They would set up the tabernacle, which was this traveling tent, and it was set up in, in just such a way, a very prescribed way. Coming back to the Ark of the Covenant, it was set aside in this special place, and they call it the Holy of Holies, and it was cordoned off, it was separated, we were separated from it. In fact, not even us, the priests, the holy Levite priests were separated from the Holy of Holies by this curtain. God's presence was something to be both treasured, revered, and even feared. I share this a lot at SNL. The priests who would attend to the Ark, they would literally have a rope wrapped around their waist because if they went past the curtain into the presence of God, there was a danger they would be overwhelmed by the power of God and killed. And the rope was tied around their waist so they could be pulled out. Their body could be pulled out to get it out of the way. So they went into that knowing that their life was hanging in the balance, that he was that powerful, that he was that holy. But this was this traveling tent we call the tabernacle. And, and this is David's like, this isn't right. Here I am, a mere man. And it's a, a demonstration of, of David's heart for the Father. He says, I live in a house of cedar. I live in a palace. It's incredible. It's beautiful. And, and the king of kings lives in a tent? This is out of order. And I, I, I like this interaction here because Nathan's first instinct, and, and church, i got to confess this to you as well. I have lacked wisdom for almost my entire life. Uh, I've lacked wisdom, and, and I, I take what I believe I know about the character of God, and I will give advice or I'll give a response without seeking His perspective, without going to God and saying, well, God, what do you want in this situation? I take 
I take the kind of the Rolodex of, of interactions with the Father, things I've read, things I've experienced, things I've learned over the years. I'm like, okay, well, this makes perfect sense, just like Nathan did here. This makes perfect sense. David, you're right. Your heart is right. You should do this. Go and do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. That was the advice that Nathan gave David. But then we read on. Verse 4 to 7 says that this. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord. Would you build me a house to dwell in? I've not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I've been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. In all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? When your days are fulfilled... And you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. David had this, this, this good intended plan, but God's plan was different. And thank God that he intervened and spoke to the prophet Nathan and said, no, wait, wait, you've given David bad advice. It's not for him to build a, a house for me, but I have a plan. I'm, I'm going to raise up somebody that comes from his lineage, one of his children, will live in this time where, where now he can build the temple. And his, his good intentions will come to fruition, but David's not going to be the one to build this. Now, there are a couple of things that I, that I draw from this. The first one is our good intentions are not good enough. We saw that with Uzzah. He had good intentions. He wanted to do what was right. He thought the right thing to do was to save the ark from falling. My dad says this all the time. I don't know what this is a quote from, but he says, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, which seems harsh. I don't know, I don't know if that's from some poet that I've never heard of before, but um, that's one of the things I grew up hearing. Um, but our good intentions, we can feel good about it. It feels right to us. But good intentions, absent of seeking the will of the Father is a recipe for disaster. Church, we've got to get back in the habit of slowing down our responses, slowing down our opinions, slowing down our actions. And there's a balance to be struck. Sometimes we can overanalyze and we can wait with our fleece ready to hear from God. And sometimes we just need to move and act on things. And let God correct us, steer us while we move. There, there's a, a balance to be struck there. But I, I think that, I know, okay, I'll speak to myself. I know that I have, have gotten into a rhythm, into a groove of walking up my life without seeking Him, even on some of the little things. And you know what, communion, what we did today was an important thing, and I'm just realizing I left out a, a talk I wanted to do at the beginning. A part of communion is this resetting of our heart, too. We're given some pretty explicit instructions about how to enter into this time of sharing communion. One of the things is, is we need to examine our heart. And we need to be considering what our relationship is like with our brother and our sister. Is there something we need to figure out and sort out with them even before we, we share this time of communion. Also, this is more than just a snack pack. Okay? This is representative of the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus. We need to treat this with reverence it's due. And I'll be blunt. Uh, we, don't, we don't do communion at SNL anymore. And it's not that they're not worthy. 
not by a long shot. It's that we haven't taught through this the way it needs to be taught through. We, we want to engage with our, our people at SNL, introduce them to Jesus, welcome them into community, into discipleship. And then in the context of a room like this, we can teach that, that need for the way we walk through things like communion. But communion is a good time. This is what I wanted to say at the end. That communion is a good time to press that reset button, to do that introspection, and to call out, re remind yourself that we need to call out and ask God what His will is for us. I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up. And, and we do, if, if we remember and we stick to our schedule, we missed last month for communion. If, if we do this right, we're, we're meeting once a month to share communion together. That's not often enough for that, for that point of introspection and reflection and consultation with the Father. So I would encourage you. Th this is what I want to send you with today is I encourage you to build in times, intentional times, in your prayer life. Say, God, wh what is your will for me? And if you're going through something important in your life, if, if this is a kind of a, a landmark moment in your life, ask for his will on what you're doing. I love, I don't want to, share your laundry, but the DeBoers went through a process of, of uh, they were invited, Barry's doing really well in his job, and he was invited to take on a store on Vancouver Island. And it was appealing for a lot of reasons. But they sought the will of God. They went through a process, and then in the end, they, they gave it to God, and, and we're blessed. We get to keep it for a while. <laughs> and, and, I, and we need more of that. We need more of these times of coming before God transparently, not with our own agenda, but seeking His will. Okay. These seats are available to you if you want to come up and be blessed in worship to get it from both sides. This is our time to stand and worship together, and then Alex, I'll let, I'll let you dismiss us.